welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hey, this is Jessica with Turn the Page podcast, Syosset Public Library, and today our guest is, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Marissa Hollywood. I'm the author of a few local history books, and today we're going to talk about amusement parks, right? Yeah, we are, and I'm really excited about it. This is one of my favorite topics. I love talking about um, bygone Long Island. I don't get to talk about it all that much on um, Turn the Page, or at least I'd have to say as much as I would like to. So as soon as I heard about you and your book and your topic, it was one of those, I need to get on this right away because this is really exciting. Um, so first, I guess, um, tell us the title of your book and we'll get into the topic. Sure, yeah. So I actually wrote uh, two local history books. The first one was for um, the Images of America series. It's um, on Nunley's Amusement Park. And that's what started it all. And I'll talk about Nunley's a little bit more later on. But so that book was just about the one park. And it's mostly, if, I'm sure if you've seen any of those um, from the Arcadia Publishing Series, they're wonderful. They're just like really great coffee table books. They have a lot of images and um, interesting facts. But after I wrote it, there was so much interest in other parks. People kept saying, you know, Nunley's is great, but this was my park. So then I wrote um, Historic Amusement Parks of Long Island. And that was through the history press. And so this one's a little bit more narrative. It's more stories. It goes into a little bit more detail and there's less images. Okay, so Marissa, um, so I guess my first question is when did these amusement parks develop? Sure, so so yeah, the, the book is a little deceiving in its title because it does focus completely on kitty parks, these smaller family owned businesses that were spread throughout Long Island. And so, I mean, I guess, to answer that question, you've got to step back a little bit and just talk about general amusement park history. So first amusement parks in America were found along the East Coast and you would find them more in green spaces, fields, groves, beaches, and they were right along the outskirts of developing cities. And these early parks were usually based around a single amusement. So usually a carousel. And then later on, they might evolve into these like full-fledged amusement centers that had lots of rides and games. And New York itself has just been a hub for amusements since the American amusement park industry like boomed here in Coney Island in the early 1800s. So, you know, as, as Manhattan was starting to grow, new immigrant populations are coming in, people wanted to escape the congestion of the city during the summers, these seaside areas of outer boroughs like Coney Island and Brooklyn and Rockaway, Queens, that's where people were going because they had all these inexpensive outdoor amusements that were easily accessible by public transportation. So, you know, it first started with picnic sites, but then amenities started to develop to kind of capitalize on this. And uh, so in the early, you know, 1800s, we start to see things being built, Coney Island House in 1829. And then um, by the 1850s, there were all these pavilions where you could do dancing and bathing and penny arcades and all these different things, food. By 1875, there's a railroad line that's built. And then that's when numbers really increase. People are really coming out there. And so at the, the turn of the century, many of these beach resorts uh, that were nearby or that were part of the large amusement parks had a few so-called kiddie rides that were within their gates, but the amusements were generally focused on adults. By 1930, some of these parks had established kiddie areas um, within them. And so, they a lot of times had miniature versions of their main rides and they were segregated into the corners. And the idea was like, okay, they're off to the side so children wouldn't get hurt by these larger, more dangerous rides, right? These big rickety roller coasters and things. The Hershey Company was the forerunner in children's amusement parks. And in 1915, Hershey Park in Hershey, Pennsylvania, they sectioned off an area of the park with some like playground type amusements, like slides and swings. But then in the 1920s, they had a boat ride and a mini Ferris wheel. And then Kennywood Park, which was located in a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they also created a kiddie land within their park. And this one was much more elaborate. 
the, the owners of the park created these miniature versions of the 16 most popular rides in the park. The first amusement park that was entirely dedicated to children was started by Cece McDonald, who opened Kitty Park in San Antonio, Texas in 1925. That was the first one that was just for kids. This is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> That's so exciting. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess like my next question is, okay, so uh, we made the distinction early on um, when you were talking about just the name of the books. What are the difference between, I guess, kitty parks and theme parks? I guess amusement parks are sort of, because I think of, when I think of a theme park, I think of Disney and I think of Universal, which is, you know, they're all centered around a theme. And then there's amusement parks, which are like, Again, this is to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong. There's Six Flags, and there's um, I think there's one called King's Dominion. I don't know if it's still around um, someplace. But then there's you know Adventureland on Long Island, which is, as you were mentioning, it has kitty sections and it has kitty versions of bigger rides, but it's not a kitty park. So what are the difference between kitty parks and the other types of parks? Sure. So. So obviously it was a later development really capitalizing on something. And that something was the end of World War II, right? And, and the baby boom. So there's this explosion in the amusement park industry at the turn of the century. And then it's, it's kind of subsequent demise with the Great Depression. We don't see a rise in amusement parks again until after the end of World War II. And then if we think, even if we just think locally, like Nassau County saw a double in its population numbers, right? To more than a million residents mm -hmm. after that in the decade that follows the war, the end of the war. And so with this like mushroom of growth in the population of the suburbs here, there was a significant number of small children. So kitty parks kind of you know, somewhere in existence, but that became big business because there were just so many families and so many opportunities to, you know, to entertain these groups. So yeah, so these veterans, they return home, they leave the crowded cities, they start families, and the kiddie land comes. And then even like malls and shopping centers, parks, all of them tried to capitalize on this new audience by adding small rides and carousels. But in the late 40s and early 50s, large theme parks start to develop across the country. And they have huge amounts of property. They have like, like exciting rides, various amenities, and they completely blow away the offerings of these tiny but numerous kitty parks. Some kitty parks did close, but a lot of them were able to continue operating because it was this like hyper local experience, right? You weren't driving really more than 20 minutes from your house to go to them. And I think people like them. They were less expensive. As I said, they're close to home and they had stronger ties to the immediate community. So I think that's what kind of rescued them. But it was just less property, less rides. Um, I don't want to say less excitement, but like a little bit calmer, a little bit easier maybe for the parents and the kids and less expensive, which is important at that time. Of course, and I think you have to mention, obviously, just um, the growth of suburbia with Levittown and then all that came around it. Uh, Long Island did become more populated around that time, um, and, you know, we continue to see that today um, with, the, with the growth. And um, the, the parks themselves, you know, it's funny, you said maybe a little bit less exciting. I don't think it was less exciting to the kids, uh, but we'll, sure. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, so another question I had, because this is actually something I didn't realize for a bit, uh, that the parks often became remembered by the name of the adjoining restaurant um, on the property. How did that begin to happen? Well, this was really interesting uh, when we had started talking about this because when I st started to go back into my research, there was no like concrete answer. At first, I thought that the restaurants came first all the time, and it did in many cases. So, like, I'm going to talk more about Nunley's and Baldwin, but with Nunley's Museum Park, the original restaurant on the property was called the Dutch Mill, and it was in operation we know at, in 1939. And there was a carousel at the site at that point. The carousel building was there and the restaurant building was attached to it. And, you know, a lot of these restaurants you're going to see, it's like beach kind of food, like hot dogs, fruit drinks, frozen custard, things like that. 
And then in 1947, so that's, you know, a good amount of years after that, additional rides were added and it became a park. But that site was always referred to as Nunley's. I, until I did the research, I never heard Dutch Mill. I don't think most people would know that. Yeah. But then there, but there were also instances where the kitty park was created, like, um, first. So, like, Fairyland Kitty Park, also known as Buddy's Fairyland, which was in Canarsie. So the restaurant next to the park was called Buddy's Food and Fun. And again, it was like fish and chips, hamburgers, roast beef sandwiches, boardwalk type the thing. good stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but due to the popularity of the restaurant, most visitors and people today will remember the park as Buddy's. But it was, it was added later on. William Nunley, who opened Nunley's in Baldwin, actually owned a number of amusement parks. And one of them was called Nunley's Happy Land. It was his dream park. It was a lot more property. It was on Hempstead Turnpike in Bethpage, and it opened in 1951. So a little oh bit later God. on. Oh my God, how did I not know that this existed? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And so it was, but this one was, it was like everything he learned from his other parks, because he had some in Queens and in Brooklyn. And then of course the Baldwin Park, he was like, he learned from everything. And so this one was designed to be an all weather amusement park. So there was like lots of indoor parts as well. So it could stay open all year round, which was like the biggest issue with so many of these parks that if it was raining or once the season ended, like that's it. So in 1952, Happy Land's doing really well. There's a lot of success. A restaurant opened like adjacent called Jolly Rogers. And this full scale restaurant was on the park site, but it was run by someone separate. And again, it was like classic American fare, hot dogs, hamburgers, fried chicken, clams, hot sandwiches, ice cream, stuff like that. And the restaurant was connected to the park through a glass walled passage. Early advertisements for Happy Land, uh, once the restaurant opened, it didn't even mention it at, like, at all. But um, other ads that the restaurant ran only kind of briefly mentioned the park. So it's interesting. They weren't really promoting each other, but it was just like naturally happening when people came there. A lot of times, if you went to one, you might get a coupon for the other place, you know, so like some free food or like a free ride, things like that. And um, there was a clown that was the that park's mascot. So anyone that went to that place would remember this. I think they called him Happy. And in uh, 50, 1951, he started being called the, the Nunley's Clown. Most people, though, remember that park as Jolly Rogers. When I say Nunley's Happy Lands, did, did that spring something yeah, for you? Yeah, so I had, um, in some of the bygone Long Island websites that I followed, I have seen, um, I have seen Jolly Rogers referred to. So I did not know that they were one and the same. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, so that restaurant, it changed names in 1974 and it became Robin Hood. And then in 76, it closed. And the amusement park was still open, but it closed like two years after that. And, you know, as we'll talk about with later on, it was just rising operation costs and less children, things like that. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, well, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that. Um, yeah. What I want to talk about is some favorite places, um, but you know, why this topic resonates with me. I mean, okay, so there was definitely a kitty park in Syosset that we know. There was uh, Lollipop Farms. That's right. Um, yep, there were, you know, um, lots of pictures, or maybe it's only one picture of the kids on the little train. Now that I think about it, I feel like there's really only one picture I've seen of it. Either that or like every picture taken of it pretty much just looks the same. If you know what I'm referring to. I, I do. I know exactly the one. The conductor's right there. It's yes. on the train. Yep. It's this classic shot of Lollipop Farms. Yes. I yeah. do have a ton more shots of it, but that's the one it's, that's always around. <laughs> yeah. I think in our local history department um, or outside of our local history department at the library, that's hanging up. Uh, but I believe there were animals, were there animals there and there were other things. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting place, very fun, um, lots of different rides, a lot of like painted um, pieces throughout. It definitely sounded like a really fun place to bring. And um, I'm going to be doing a lecture at the library and I'll have a ton of historic photos, as many as I could get, which wasn't that many. It's hard <laughs> with a lot of these parks because there just was so, yeah, they were so little. We didn't really document them that great then. And, and I think it's a lot of home yeah. photos and home movies well so that actually is kind of something that just popped up and then i want to talk about my favorite place okay. <laughs> and we can because um i 
first, you know, when I grew up in Syosset, Lollipop Farms had been gone for quite a while, but there was a kitty park that was basically like my Disney on Long Island. Uh, and I'll get there in a second. But um, just thinking about it, you know, I think we're also used to people having a camera everywhere now. You can just pick up your phone and you take a picture and it's like a really good picture. So people have thousands and thousands of pictures of every second of their life. But I guess back then, like cameras were expensive and film was expensive and you didn't just snap pictures of everything, you know, like that was kind of sacred almost. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's so true. So, I mean, with both of the books, the majority of the images came from local residents and it was just it's so funny because it's like the same exact shots over and over again <laughs> yes it's just the kids are changing the kids in the outfits are changing um but yeah lollipop farm it sounded I, I mean i wish i could have gone there it sounded really fun it opened uh i guess about 19 no it opened june of 1950 and so again, it makes so much sense with the timing of this. And at that time, it was the only children's zoo on Long Island. So they really capitalized the idea of the of the animals and had I think it only had four acres of property, but it, you know there was pony rides and yeah. donkey cart rides and their whole thing is they provided lollipops for every visitor <laughs> and uh, the farm's namesake and mascot lollipop was a goat. <laughs> that lived at the farm. And um, let's see, so yeah, at that point, the LAE didn't extend to Nassau County yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, cause it was located on Jericho Turnpike. So I'm not super familiar with that area, but I can tell you that the site of Lollipop Farms is now currently a DSW designer shoe warehouse store. So I can actually say, hearing that, I spent a lot of time at, um, that, that story? no, um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time at quote unquote Lollipop Farms, but way after it was Lollipop Farms, prior to that uh, being a shoe store, it was Borders Books and Music in Syosset, and ah. I worked there for quite a while, um, you know, uh, when I was home from college and then a little bit after um, I graduated and began school for library science. Uh, so I spent a lot of time there. I'm very familiar with that area um, and no offense to DSW, but Borders is so, so missed. Although I'm sure <laughs> yeah. that people who drove by Borders said the same thing about Lollipop Farms. And then I'm what sure whatever it was beforehand, which I feel like it was, was it like a Pergamon? I, I can't remember. It was something else, but Borders is what I will always remember it. <laughs> um, so, okay, so let's get to um, other favorite places. So when I was a kid, um, my parents would take me to a place called McGinnis's. Yes. Um, McGinnis's, was to me like if we heard that we were going to McGinnis's that was like you're going to Disney World <laughs> it was so exciting and I mean I remember the rides I remember like there was like this boat ride and the water in it now that I like I remember the water being very green and now I'm thinking about <laughs> it and I'm like rrr, rrr, maybe, <laughs> maybe they didn't clean it but it was but that was never an issue for me I mean I knew better than to stick my fingers in it um, you know, people would throw pennies into it. I, I remember that very distinctly. I also remember like this helicopter ride, which mm -hmm. would go up and down. And that was a big favorite of mine. Um, I can't remember exactly when McGinnis is closed, but uh, a while back I did a little research and um, I know it's now a parking lot, I think for like a bank or something or a Panera, but it's, it's a place that I've I've parked my car several times, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've parked yeah. my car on the grave of McGinnis's. <laughs> yeah, so let me tell you some history about it. I bet there's a bunch of stuff you probably don't know because it was before your time. So it was it was called Kitty Haven when it opened in September of 1950, and at that point, there was just four rides, and the owner of the park, his name was Arthur Nelson. He was a ride manufacturer and operator, so he was like this really shrewd businessman, he didn't spend a lot of money on promotions or advertising at all during the first year. He just kind of let it go. And he chose that spot, spot in Garden City Park because it was at that moment in 1950 experiencing a boom in population 
of course, as, mm -hmm. as everywhere in Long Island was. And it was located on a busy and well-traveled highway. So there was a Howard Johnson's right across um, Jericho Turnpike, where it was. And there was also a miniature golf course and a pony ride operator that were independently operated, like right near the property. So it was so smart. There was so much going on that would just lure people into that area. And so Nelson owned a company uh, based out of Brooklyn that was like the Weld Build Body Corporation, and they made kitty rides. And they also made like tow trucks for the NYPD, but they made kitty rides. So here <laughs> yeah. he's like, this makes so much sense. You know, he's, he's producing, you know, the materials that they would do. And so that park had a Ferris wheel, a locomotive, the water boat, as you said, a tank, a carousel, and um, a whip type ride that he was actually working on a patent for. The most popular ride that my notes indicated was an eight engine locomotive ride and each car had the name of a Long Island town on it. I don't know if that sounds familiar. I don't know how long that train was there for. Yeah, I'm, you know, like I said, a lot of my memories of McGinnis's, or sorry, Kitty Haven, I should <laughs> call it now, um, are very murky because I was young um, yeah. at the time. Um, and now that I think about it, I do remember seeing uh, a sign uh, that said Kitty Haven um, with, I think like they had like, was it pictures of kids on it? Wh whatever, like, you know, I, I hope this isn't my mind suturing in something that wasn't <laughs> real because that happens sometimes. Right. But yeah, um, I do, I do recall seeing the words Kitty Haven. Um, I, I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. It's very possible the train was there. The two things I just very distinctly remember are the helicopters and the boat. And the boat rides, yeah. And those were classic ones. And mm -hmm. it's possible you wouldn't know it by Kitty Haven because in, so in 1953, so still really early on, it was um, the owner, Nelson, he sold it to a, a totally different group and they renamed it Garden Playland and Kitty, Garden Playland Kitty Park. And so... See, um, that is my mind suturing in something. <laughs> so, but who knows? You might have, they might have had original signs like around. Um, so, but the park, of course, is usually referred to by everyone I've ever spoken to as McGinnis's because there was a restaurant of that name located on the site. And in that instance, the restaurant opened shortly after the park. It opened there in August of 1953. McGinnis's was actually a chain of restaurants. They were popular in, this, in New York City. There was one in Sheepshead Bay and there was one in Times Square. And they were known for being the roast beef king. <laughs> and... Uh, the Pinsky family owned McGinnis's and they also owned the Kitty Park store. In the mid 1950s, Ted Platt, so he was the last owner, he purchased the park from the Pinskys and it's called at this point Garden Amusement Park. But again, I, I think McGinnis's was just pushed. All the advertisements I found after that time, they just kind of called it Kitty Park and Amusement Center. And I think they were just capitalizing off of the popularity of, of McGinnis's. Right. Um, so, Platt is a really interesting character. He he had run a jukebox and vending machine route, and he he knew the Pinsky family who owned the restaurant, and he would service the machines in the park's arcade, and then later on, you know, he he purchased it. So by 1972, the park had nine kitty rides, had a 35 game arcade. I don't know if you went in the arcade a lot. I saw the arcade. I was never really allowed to go in <laughs> right. the arcade. That's where the teenagers were, right? That's where the teenagers <laughs> were, and you know, like arcades in the 80s were uh kind of dark and I was afraid of that <laughs> you know that that kind of like scared me a little bit um you know there were the, the floors were always sticky not that they weren't sticky <laughs> at the park themselves but it's a little bit of a different uh feel and to a child who was seven eight and afraid of her own shadow I wouldn't have gone into the arcades. Also, my parents probably, like, they, they saw them as gambling almost. So <laughs> I, I can understand that. Yeah, no it's, arcades it's dark, it's inside, yeah, and lots of bright kind of lights and, and loud sounds. And, and your quarters, they sounds. just, they're gone. <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> um, so let's see. So that, I mean, so that had a lot of property. Their parking lot, um, I found in my research, could hold, like, 400 cars. And um, the Ted Platt, uh, an interview was quoted as saying that business was better in the 1950s before the LIE was built because there was more traffic on Jericho Turnpike, which makes a lot of sense. You'd get a lot more people kind of stopping in. So he 
Platt sold the park in 1986 and he retired. And the park was purchased um, by someone named Rocky LaBelle and he had worked at McGinnis's. He bought it with his nephew and then it closed soon after. It just couldn't oh. kind of keep up. But when I was doing my research, you know, a lot of this was kind of crowdsource. I, I had a few um, articles written in some local papers just saying the project I was working on and looking for stories and for images. And I started a Facebook page for the book. And uh, Ted Platt's two daughters reached out to me and they gave me so much information and wonderful quotes just about like what it was like being in a family that, you know, survived off of that kind of business. And I remember them saying, and I talk about this in the book, that they said rain was like a curse word in their household because that meant a loss of income, right? Because the park had to be, had to be closed. So I loved yeah. hearing stories from them about their dad. And there's this classic image that, uh, I mean, if anyone that went to McGinnis's and I'll, I'll show it to you of this like kind of rough looking guy sitting in this like almost dollhouse looking building. And that was Ted Platt. And everyone always remembers him like this kind of angry looking guy, but he, apparently he was a sweetheart. And again, people just love the park. And I'm sure the memories that you have are just like the memories I have of my park, which was Nunley's. Nunley's right. and, yeah. and Baldwin. And I bet, our, I bet our memories are like so similar because it was, they had the boat rides, they had the helicopters. It was the same kind of thing. Um, for me, it was, you know, so Nunley's was on Sunrise Highway, like right in the border between Baldwin and Freeport. And it was right next to the Freeport High School. And I went there throughout my childhood. As I mentioned, you know, a while back, it opened, you know, around 1939 was when, you know, the restaurant was definitely open and the carousel was there. But so my parents grew up in Baldwin and they went there as my dad as a child and then my mom as a teenager. So me and my brother, we were just like there all the time. And for us, it was like that carousel was like the huge thing that was yeah, really beautiful carousel, which thankfully survived and is now in its own home, you know, right between um, Cradle of Aviation and the Long Island Children's Museum. And it's just, it's just a, a beautiful kind of specimen of, of carousel history. But, but yeah, it's just like those memories of, when you drive past those spaces, so now for for me, Nunley's it's a Pep Boys, <laughs> like, and it's yeah. like you drive past it and you can't. It seems so big, like in my mind, it was a huge park and it was acres big, and then you see this like building there, and you're like, how how did my childhood fit in a Pep Boys? <laughs> yeah, it. You know, I think like a lot of things just seem so much bigger when you're yeah. a kid. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, this brings me very nicely to my next question, which is when and why did these kiddie parks begin to close? Sure. So there was like such a boom within tons of these parks were popping up because people are just trying to, to capitalize on all these children. But it was when the baby boom came to an end in the mid 1960s that the kiddie park trend around the country starts to die out as well. And then what happens is many parks just close. They just can't keep up. You know, it's a seasonal operation. It's really expensive. Depending on where they were located, like the ones that were in New York City proper had a lot more expenses and um, issues with like um, kind of health codes and safety issues, right? Yeah. Because it's all these children and things could break down. Uh, the regulations were a little bit different on the island because I think in, in Brooklyn, Queens, you had to have, each ride operator had to be licensed for that ride and that we didn't see that on the island. But so they either close outright or they started to modify to attract agent clientele. So then that's when we start to see in the 60s and 70s, arcades, miniature golf courses, batting cages, because that's, it's kind of the parks were growing along with, with the children that started to come to them. And that was, yeah. you know, really smart. So that helped them um, to last a bit longer. But I guess if, you know, for me, it's like, you know, we're both parents of young children and I keep trying to think like, what is the equivalent? today right and you know there's being on long island there's museums you know, there's nature preserves there's of course the aquarium um but i would say it's mostly it's like farms petting zoos that you see today there's also now i'm just thinking about it bounce like those little uh, bounce house places yeah, bounce that are sure. yeah that are in like warehouses or industrial areas i guess would be the closest yeah um, there's also like these handful i keep seeing them pop up like indoor kind of activity yeah. gyms where there'll be like 
play sets, um, like full size doll houses, things like that. They're small, a lot of times kitty parties, but there's nothing really, obviously Adventureland still exists, but that's still, I would say for an older child. It's not yeah. for, for little ones. No, I, not, a, not at all. It really, it really is um, very much for, yeah, older people, older families, um, teenagers, right. um, and even adults. Yeah. There's more of these like Instagrammable type locations, like, you know, like the lavender by the bay, which is beautiful. And I've gone there and I've, I've brought my children. I've taken beautiful photos, but it's not, I was having a great time. My kids could have cared less. Like they weren't <laughs> intrigued at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just totally different. I kind of mourn for that a little bit because yeah, that excitement of so many people told me, you know, particularly with Nunley's, just because I talked to so many more people about it, that parents were like, that they couldn't even drive past Nunley's. Like just if they were, they had to go around like mm-hmm. a different route because if the kids saw Nunley's, like that was it. Like the car yeah. would just erupt into chaos and that yeah. whatever adventure they were going on would <laughs> get you I, I mean, I would, cer- I would certainly believe that um, without a doubt. Um, it's, it's just, it's so, it, it's crazy because then I'm thinking, you know, I guess the closest we would have, although, you know, with the pandemic and that's kind of put a damper in bounce parks too, um, has been, um, you know, like you wait, for the summer and the carnivals pop up and they're mm-hmm. there for maybe a week and then they but it's not it's not the same as your kitty park mm-hmm. which i like pl- plenty of people kind of took took ownership over um yeah your kitty park um i did i did want to ask about one more thing there was a zoo in massapequa oh yes Oh, it's one of my favorite, favorite things. Yeah. Uh, So, yes. So there was Frank Buck's uh, and then it later became uh, the Massapequa Zoo. But yeah. And I, so, you know, I live in Massapequa now and again, it's like shopping centers, right? Mm -hmm. There's a big shopping center there. Um, But so that was on, so it's where the Sunrise Mall is now so it's right. on, on Sunrise Highway, Massapequa kind of Massapequa Park border. Uh, it was there from nineteen something was there from nineteen thirty four <laughs> yes. to nineteen sixty five, and um, there's so many really great stories uh, connected to that. But yeah, so Frank Buck was this like safari adventurer who would go into um, he he like traveled around the country in like the twenties and thirties. And uh, went all around the world. He filmed a bunch of movies. He was known as like Frank Bring Him Back Alive because he would go into uh, like the, into the jungle and like uh, capture all these wild animals and then bring them back to the state. <laughs> so, so basically, nowadays he probably would have been frowned upon for doing oh, yeah. that by I'm, conservationists. I'm, oh, <laughs> totally, totally, yeah. he would have been. But so he, you know, he kind of built his own zoo right. and um it started with um like setting up an exhibit of all these wild animals at the chicago world's fair and it was it was called frank buck's jungle camp and it was like a replica of a camp that he had set up when he was in asia and at the world's fair it saw over two million visitors so when the fair closed he moved the whole camp to long island in 1934 and it was like 40 acres it had like hundreds of lions, elephants, tigers, monkeys, a ton of wild animals. Yeah. And these like houses, there was a lion house. Oh my God. Yeah. I did not know it was that big. Yeah. There was a ton of buildings on the property. There was like a three story, this beautiful um, Tudor style building. It was called the Frank Buck Hotel. There was a restaurant, there was stores. Um, There was like a, uh, I think there was a house that was just like wild birds and like all these posters of Frank Buck on his expositions and, and things. And he was just like constantly in the New York Times covered so much about this park because animals were constantly escaping or were attacking the workers. And, you know, Frank Buck was always in and out of the hospital. He was always getting like dysentery and stuff. Oh my God. I, please, please tell me he wasn't the Joe Exotic of um, <laughs> Long Island. 
Oh, <laughs> that luck. You just gave me an interesting luck. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, to be honest with you, though, I don't think anybody is the Joe Exotic of anywhere. <laughs> I think that guy is who he is, and there's only one of him. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so he he knew he made this park, and it was and it was really popular. And then um, it was like after World War II, right? When the cost of of gasoline made it hard for people to drive like that far out onto the island. Because I mean, now we're we're, we're getting deeper east so for people coming from the cities um you know it's it's a bit of a longer drive so you know they start kind of uh selling off some of the animals to other zoos and, and things like that um by 1944 it was only 19 acres right so it had been like 40 and uh it, it kind of kept uh going down and, and down um and then in the 50s the Grimaldi family purchased it and that's when it became Sunrise, Kitty Land and Animal Farm. And so what they, and then a year later it became Massapequa Zoo and Kitty Park. And so what they did was it was like tamer animals that could be petted by little kids and pony right, rides and, right. and things like that, yeah. which there was some still ex exotic animals that were on display, but, but not really. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and we had, it was really successful. It had high attendance numbers and, um, but it was still only able to be open like six months out of the year. Of so course, that's what yeah. made a lot of these really hard to, um, to operate. And it was right next door to the Massapequa drive-in. So a lot of times as, you know, people would go there, they could see like the monkey house from like the drive, I think from the <laughs> ticket booth and um, monkey mountain. And uh, yeah, so it must have been fun. <laughs> you know, I didn't know it existed until I was um, eating at Krish's. And sure. I saw an old um, ad for it and had to kind of do a double take and then look that up and be like, oh my God, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I know, I know. That's the thing. It's just like so many of these places, since they closed such a long time ago, it was like once they closed, that was it. For me, it was like, you know, I had done the, the research for the book. I wasn't in the area at that time. Um, I was further west, but like, one day I was at in the Massapequa Mall parking lot and I was just like at the light waiting to turn. And I saw one of those like, um, you know, I don't know if it's federal, but one of those like green right. landmark yes. signs. And it was yes. like, this was the site of the Frank Buck Hotel. And I was like, oh my goodness, so it's right here. And it's just, I'm pretty sure there's like a DSW over there too. It's just so sad. DSW is just, <laughs> DSW, if anyone is like listening and works for DSW, I'm sorry that we keep knocking on them um or dragging them but man <laughs> you know yeah um, well because with like the pep boys with nunley so many people were like i will never go into that pep boys because they just it's it's the animosity i really wanted to do like a book signing there i'm like maybe this would be good for for them but it's like time passes and now people don't remember they just drive past and maybe yeah. they don't even think As, about it yeah. um yeah but um so what are you working on now? Are you working on another book? Oh, I wish. Um, for the last bunch of years, I've been working on my PhD. Okay. So I am not allowing myself to do any, any more local history research. Um, but I, I really want to do, there's a bunch of projects in my mind that, that I would love to pick up again. Cause I just, I just think Long Island is amazing and it has such a rich history and, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to do something about like the restaurants mm -hmm. on Long Island, uh, you know, kind of leading to the beaches. Um, th there's so, there's just so much and there's such wonderful archives. So many of the libraries like yours um, have these great collections, but I think the best research, the best anecdotes that I got were from people that lived here. And a lot of people moved away. I think a lot of the, you know, the Facebook fans I have for Nunley's, it's, like more than 3,000 people, a lot of them don't live locally anymore. So, you know, it's, I think it's just about, the amusement parks was so great because it was just happy memories of childhood. And yeah. it's such a beautiful gift to be able to give back to the community, like those types of memories of when time seems simpler and, you know, you know, maybe our parents or grandparents were still with us and we were, young and I just kind of love 
living in that moment. So I hope to, to keep working on projects like that, that just makes people happy. Cause that's the best. When I, when these books came out and I was doing the circuit of like local libraries and historical societies to see the faces out in the audience, when I would flash through these pictures, it was just so funny because they were like these whimsical smiles on everyone's face. And, uh, especially in times like now, it's like, you just want some of those happy memories. Oh, thank you so much for talking to me about this. Um, thank you so much for talking to us about this. This was wonderful. Um, we look forward to um, seeing your lecture and we look forward to hearing more from you um, <laughs> because I will talk to you about any bygone Long Island topic you would like. Okay. Sounds just good. Just throw something feel. out there and we could just freewheel. It'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. All right. So once again, this was Jessica and my guest was Marissa Hollywood. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.